In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> we are in the second week of Advent, and on, today is December 12th. And today is a very special day. Over three million people today are walking in their, on their knees, going today to pray before the great image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And the Virgin Mary, she, she's, her image is miraculously impressed on the cloth of St. Juan Diego. In a nutshell, here's the story. The, about 20 years before, the great Cortez landed with his ships in Veracruz. And all his soldiers, some of them were a little, maybe a little scared because they were going into pagan territory. But they were, they were asked by the Queen and King of Spain, go bring these people to the Holy Catholic faith because they're pagans and we cannot save our soul outside of the religion Jesus Christ established, which is what? The Holy Roman Catholic Church, right? So, Cortes, to put away all second doubts in his men, when they arrived onto the beaches of Veracruz, he had all the ships unloaded, everything taken out, and everything precious put in boxes, and he burnt the ships. Burnt them. So the men can't say, well, I want to go home now, if they got cold feet. So they went into the jungles of Mexico, over the mountains, and they heard from the people how they were sacrificing thousands and thousands of people on the altars to Satan. They would tear them down, lay them down on an altar, rip open their belly with a sharp knife. And you can see many of these knives in the museum in Mexico City today. And they have skulls carved on the ends of them and satanic symbols. They would rip open the belly and tear the heart out while beating and offer it to Satan the god of the sun or the god of the moon, but the god of the Gentiles are, are devils. And they did this to thousands and thousands of victims. And the, what was happening was in Mexico City, the big tribe of the Maos, the Aztecs, they were going out and enslaving other tribes and dragging them in to be sacrificed. And the prime, the prime objects of sacrifice were the young men and the virgin girls, the athletes, and the, 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 the fighting soldiers. So they were sacrificed to Satan. In one month they were sacrificing 80,000 people. That would empty the town of New London plus a few other towns around here. So this was the fear people lived in. And who's next? Uh, is our house, is our tribe going to be surrounded next? And us I and mean, my family and my my brothers and my sisters and my mom and dad uh, chained up, roped, and dragged to Mexico City to be sacrificed as victims. That's the fear people lived in. So the great Cortez, which the modern historians love to spit on, and they love to drag him down as a slave maker, he was anything but. He freed these people. And he marched into Mexico City with his soldiers, and they made war against these bad wicked priests and they stormed the pyramids and he put a huge statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary on top of the pyramid Our Lady of La Conquistador and they went they, they had, had many days of ferocious battle so the great Cortez he brought the Catholic faith and the priests and the missionaries started to settle in Mexico. But it was always, it was like, it was like chewing a mouthful of peanut butter as far as conversions. There were not many. It was hard, hard work. Many of them were not converting to the Catholic faith. They were pagans. But the Aztec tribe around Mexico City, which is in kind of the heart of Mexico, uh, they weren't stupid people. They built a huge city on a, a lake with some really great engineering. 
and they knew the constellations of the stars very well. They were very inclined towards the mathematics and engineering. But they were pagans. They worshipped the sun god and the moon god. And their thinking was darkened in this way. They thought that for the moon to rise at night, they had to offer blood and the moon would rise. And then for the sun to rise, they also had to offer blood and victims. And the, 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 moon, the sun in many of the drawings and art of the pagan Indians shows itself thirsty. He's thirsty for human hearts. And many of the gods of the pagan gods of the Aztecs, including some of the Indians that were in the United States as well, they, they were bloodthirsty, and some of them were pictured with human hearts all over them. So, you know, we think this is barbaric and pagan, but you older folks all know how the abortions in our country are worse than anything that existed on the pyramids. Far worse. We're more barbaric than the Aztecs, except we have antibacterial soap, and our, uh, our hospitals are clean. But... The horrible, dark immorality that takes place is worse than anything, all the bloodshed on these pyramids. So it's very important to understand this was the, this was the ground that the Virgin Mary came to. And she didn't appear way out in the mountains or in the deserts. She went right into the camp of the devil, right where they were worshipping Satan. And she appeared on the hill called Tepayak. It's not too big of a hill, but uh, there's a Carmelite convent on top of it now. And one of the good sisters, Sister Suor Maria, she just died this past year. So pray for her, and when she gets to heaven, she probably can pray to her. So <clears throat> she was a Carmelite nun and uh, on, on Mount Tepayac. And it's there that a man, Juan Diego, he was going walking over the hill, and he was going to get a priest to take care of his dying uncle, who had a wound, and he was going to go find the priest to go bring him extreme unction, because he had converted, and a number of people had converted to Catholicism, but it was hard work for the priests. So the bishop who became established, one of the first bishops of Mexico, Bishop Zumaraga was his name, he, uh, he sent, he, he, he was in Mexico City at the time. So Juan Diego, going over the hill, he saw this beautiful young lady, surrounded by light. And she said, my little Juanito, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to go get the priest, because my uncle's dying. And she said, don't worry, your uncle's going to be fine. I'm with him, and he's cured right now. And he, he was wondering, who is this? And uh, the image, of course, it was the Virgin Mary. She said, I want you to go to the bishop. Tell him that I want a church built right here. So Juan Diego said, okay, I'll go tell him. And he went to the bishop. He knocked at the door. And all the priests were there and some of the monks and some of the lay helpers. And he said, I, need, I have a message for the bishop. And he said, he saw the bishop, and the bishop said, okay, what's, what's your message? He said, this beautiful woman appeared to me, and she wants a church built on Mount Tepayac. And the bishop said, well, <clears throat> well, tell that woman that I need some proof. <clears throat> I need uh, proofs that she's really from heaven and not deceiving us, because the devil can deceive he can appear like an angel of light to deceive even the elect, as the scripture says. So, St. Juan Diego, um, uh, his uncle was in a, in a, he was going back and forth over to see his uncle, and he decided one day he's not, he's not going to see the Virgin Mary. He's too much in a hurry, and he was going to go around the hill, because the Virgin Mary asked him to meet there the next day. But he thought, well, I have too urgent a case. i got to see my uncle. I don't have time to see her. I'll see her tomorrow. So the Virgin Mary came down the hill, and she 
stood in his way around the hill. <laughs> and she said to him, Die Juanito, your uncle's cured. And he said, but the, he said, the, I told the bishop that you wanted the church built. And, she, and he said, but he wants a sign. And the Virgin Mary told him, my little Juanito, which means my little uh, Johnny. That's what would it be in English, my little Johnny, Juanito. Uh, she said to him, Juanito, among other words, she said, I am your mother, and all, and I want all to come into the folds of my mantle. Are you sad? Are you troubled? Come to me. I'm your mother, and I will take care of you. That, and she said that not just to Juanito, but to all of us. To all of us. We have a mother in heaven. Now, all of you love your mom, and we have a lot of children here, and you all love your mom, and no one can replace a mom. But you also have a mother in heaven who has been given power by God to crush the head of the devil, the serpent, the snake. And she always protects those who wear her scapular and pray her rosary. That's why you got to keep faithful to these things. So the Virgin Mary told Juanito, go on the hill. This was December 12th. Do flowers grow in winter? Are there leaves on the tree in winter? It's December 12th. 12th today. Do you see leaves on the trees outside? No, in winter time there's no flowers and there's no leaves on the trees and there's no fruits, right? Except for evergreens. When they're real. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so the Virgin Mary told Juan Diego, go up on the hill and gather the roses. And Juanito must have wondered, he said, well it's winter, there's no roses growing now. But he believed her, because she's the mother of God. And he went up, and he gathered, he saw a rose bush, and he gathered, plucked off the roses, and gathered them in his tilma. Now this tilma was worn by many of the shepherd people in, in Mexico, because it was, some, it was like a, a bag, they could carry stuff in. It was a poncho to keep them warm when they had to sleep at night, watching the sheep. And it was just an extra protection for the cold So at night. So he went up and he gathered in his tilma the roses. And he gathered them in the Virgin Mary. He brought them to her and she rearranged them with her own hands. The mother's touch. And he wrapped them up and he brought them to the bishop's house. And he knocked at the door. And they said, oh, oh, here's this guy again. He's always troubling us with messages from the top of the hill from some lady. And uh, he said, no, I have, the, I have to see the bishop. Oh, you just wait here. You've always bothering us. And he says, no, I have to see the bishop. I have a message for him. So finally they got through to the bishop. And the bishop, who was actually a very good bishop, a very holy bishop, and a Franciscan, and when he, and he called Juan Diego into his office, and they were standing there with him, other priests and some other people, because he was in a meeting of some sort. And St. Juan Diego, he walked right in, and he threw the roses on the ground in front of these 13 people, 12 people. He was the 13th. And the bishop just froze. And all the people just froze. Because what they saw was when he dropped the roses, and they were Castilian roses, firstly, they only grow in Spain. They don't grow in the U.S. or in, in Mexico or in South America. Castilian roses grow in, in Castile in Spain. And that's the kind of roses they were, miraculously. Which, by the way, the nuns, the Carmelite nuns on Mount Tepeyac, they still keep these, this, this rose bush alive, and they still keep the roses growing from that same rose bush today. That's why they pass out rose petals from that rose bush that was miraculously put there by the Virgin Mary. So when he dropped the roses, the bishop saw on his tilma the miraculous image of Guadal Our Lady of Guadalupe as it were, painted before their eyes. 
It just appeared before their eyes. And they were shocked. And when that happened, they realized, the bishop realized, this is miraculous, and I will have to build that church to Our Lady of Guadalupe. And he did later. And what happened with when that image spread and people saw it, and they were touching it and kissing the image, and many people were miraculously cured. And one, it was carried in all the towns of Mexico, and all these Aztec savages that were massacring victims, they all, when they saw this tilma, they converted to the Catholic faith. And the priests were baptizing day and night for months. Their arms got sore and heavy. They were so often baptizing. And they all wanted to be baptized to the Catholic faith. It was a miraculous conversion of Mexico, the year 1531. And in one town, they carried the image of Our Lady, and the, the Indians were ju jumping and dancing with joy. And one of them took his bow and arrow and shot it in the air, just out of joy. He was probably a 15 or 16-year-old kid who would only thoughtlessly do something like this. Because when you shoot an arrow up, it's also going to come down, right? Well, it did come down, and it struck another boy right through his neck and killed him. And everybody was, they were rejoicing, but it just turned into sorrow because they saw one of the kids killed by accident. So the priest carrying the tilma in procession, they touched the boy with the cloth of Our Lady. They, they pulled out the arrow, and he was already not breathing. He was already cold. It was already still starting to get cold because when the body dies, you start getting cold because there's no more blood circulation. The soul separates from the body. But he touched the boy with the tilma and he miraculously, his, eye, his eyelashes started moving. He got color back in his cheeks. He started to move his hands and feet and he became miraculously back to life. So just many, many thousands of miracles like this through Our Lady of Guadalupe. Now, one of the most impressive things about the shroud is, I mean, about the tilma of the Virgin Mary of Guadalupe is this. One, it's made of cactus material. It's made from a cactus called maguey, which is a plant. And the plant is made into to fabric and that material only lasts about 20 years. If you want an example, just put a bowl of salad or spinach on your counter and leave it there for two weeks. It's going to dry up after two weeks and you're going to pick it up. It'll crumble, right? So after 20 years, the tilma of the Virgin Mary should just crumble. It shouldn't be supple, but today it's, it's miraculously supple. And it's perfectly intact. And then NASA did a study on the shroud, on, on the tilma. They put it through a CAT scan. They studied the image very closely. And they found miraculous things about it. One, there's no paint. It's not painted by paintbrush. The colors are floating on the fibers of the material. They're penetrating them, but they're floating on them. And even the knots and the imperfections of the weaving of the tilma, they all play into the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And then they find that the eyeballs reflect like real human eyeballs. And they found in the reflection of the eyes 13 people. Among them was St. Juan Diego himself, the bishop, Zumaraga, and the other people that were standing around, and priests and Franciscans. And you can see their bearded faces. It's impressive. And then what really uh, gave them the cold chills was this. They have maps of the constellations of the stars, right? So they laid the constellation of the stars on the tilma and found that the stars that are on her mantle match 
exactly the position of the stars and their constellations on December 12, 1531. So that on her heart is the constellation of the star Virgo, which means virgin, the pure heart of Mary. On her head is the constellation of the star Aurora Borealis, which is the crown. On her stomach, where the baby Jesus was in her womb, because she appears with child, December 12th, she's with child expecting. The constellation of the star on her stomach is the constellation of Leo, which is the lion. And we know the prophecy that Christ is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. So when NASA discovered this, and, and even more, they found that the constellations are so laid out on her mantle that they're not looking from the earth to the heavens, but they're rather so organized that it's looking from above the sun to earth. <laughs> and then uh, many other miraculous things about the tilma. Is she, her hands are folded. And the Aztecs thought, is she God? But her hands are folded and her head is bowed. So she's praying to someone higher. So the Indians were saying, she must be praying to the sun god. But, but the priest explained, no. Because if she, if she was praying to the sun god, why would the sun be behind her? She's greater than the sun. And that's the, the sun's lights are shining behind her. So she's greater than the sun, and she's standing on the moon, the moon god. So she's greater than the false gods of the pagan Aztecs. And so, but she's not God because her hands are folded and she's praying to someone higher. Now there was a special flower, <coughs> excuse me, with four petals that grew in Mexico. And this flower was a rare flower and it, and, and it was always a symbol for the Aztecs. It was a symbol of the greatest most worthy and majestic and noble person. And that flower exists on the, the tunic of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and it appears right on her stomach. And who's under her stomach? The baby Jesus, who is the living God, who is Christ the King, the eternal High Priest. And that flower is right on... So when the Indians saw that flower, and they knew that she had the cord around her stomach, which meant she's expecting a baby. They could conclude she was carrying the living God in her womb. She's the mother of God. And the Aztecs knew this constellation of the stars very well. So they could read right into every image and symbol on the, on the tilma. And the, 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 the mountains, the flowers, all the different other flowers, and all the star structures. And they concluded... This, this is the mother of God. And of course the priest explained to them the cross on her neck and the, uh, and the whole image of Our Lady. And she's wearing also the color blue, which belongs to a royal queen, the highest woman. And um, she also has some gold on her, which shows uh, also her great, her, her regal status. And so this tilma is still hanging in Mexico today. When Archbishop Lefebvre went to pray before that tilma, and when he went to Mexico in the 1980s, he knelt down in front of it, and of course they have, it's an ugly modern basilica. It's built by a priest who was in charge at that time. He didn't even believe in Our Lady of Guadalupe, he was a Freemason. There's big signs that he was linked with the Freemasons. And they, the old basilica is beautiful, but the new one is very ugly. But in the new one, they have the, the great image of Our Lady Guadalupe. So when you go in front of it, there's a, a moving sidewalk. So it's, it's a moving like an assembly line. So when the archbishop went, he knelt down on that moving sidewalk, and as he came in front of the image, it stopped. The moving sidewalk just stopped. 
and he continued to pray and then it started up again and, and no one knew how how or why in 1937 when the during the time of the terrible persecutions when the communists and the freemasons were persecuting the catholic church putting to death Thousands of great Cristero soldiers, of Catholic priests. Father Pro was shot, as you know, and uh, many good bishops were put to death. Many good priests, nuns, and some nuns had to escape for their life uh, and flee the country. And it's in that time, 1937, the the Freemasons thought, well, let's let's get rid of this image of Our Lady Guadalupe. Let's get rid of this superstition. So they planted a, in a flower pot a bomb. And they put the flower pot at the base on top of the altar under the image of Our, Our Lady of Guadalupe, the real one. And it blew. And it blew with such an explosion, it shattered the glass of the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the glass frame, the wood was broken, the altar was destroyed. The crucifix was bent backwards, made of heavy, heavy bronze and about that tall. It was bent backwards, and you can still see that down in Mexico City in the Basilica today. The Freemasons tried to destroy it, but did they succeed? No. The image was completely intact, untouched. It should have burnt up. It should have just, just burst into sawdust. But it was miraculously protected by, of course, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And in recent times, they have actually put a stethoscope on the, the heart of the Virgin Mary. That's something the doctors will hear your heart beat, right? They put a stethoscope on the heart of the Virgin Mary, and they hear her heart beat. It's as if she's present in the tilma. And they also hear another heartbeat, a smaller one, and a faster beat which is the baby Jesus in her womb. It's impressive. And then uh, in 2006, when Mexico, to, to, uh, to her shame, fell and permitted the abortion law, the terrible, horrible abortion law in Mexico, for 24 hours, the, the baby Jesus in the womb of Mary, in the tilma, shined with a bright light. And that bright light shows the baby, the baby Jesus like a little child in the mother's womb. You know how they curl up in the fetal position. He's, he's just like that. And it's shining for 24 hours on that day when they passed the abortion law in Mexico to show that they kill, truly kill human babies. And um, uh, if you look at the tilma, I don't know if you have an image here, but if you look at the tilma, the Virgin Mary's right foot, her right foot actually looks like a, a baby's head wrapped in a blanket, but he's upside down. And the explanations I have heard are that the Virgin Mary stands as defender to protect the innocent children. But they, the children that are aborted they cannot see the face of God. That's why the baby is looking downward. They, they go to limbo. But the Virgin Mary, she stands defenders of the, of, of the innocent and of the children. And that applies to our country as well, that has had the horrible abortion law since 1973. And in some of the Asian countries, they've had the abortion law since 1920. In the 30s and 40s, we think these are the good old days, but they were massacring children already. So the whole world has become like a bloodbath with all the abortions and the apostasy, the abandoning of God and turning away from God and spitting on his laws. And that's why the Virgin Mary wants you, especially you children, and Our Lady has a special love for children. She appeared to children in La Salette. She appeared to children in Fatima. She appears to the innocent childlike souls of saints, and all their bodies are incorrupt. That's why probably St. Juan Diego is probably incorrupt. 
Um, and here in Wisconsin, you have the only approved apparition of the Virgin Mary on American soil, which is the Virgin Mary appearing, what's the name of that town? Robinsonville. Robinsonville? In Robinsonville. And uh, Sister Adela, who saw the Virgin Mary, and the, the, the message was basically, learn your catechism, learn your catechism, and some also about the fires that spread through, and she would protect it, and she did protect that area. But I bet, I bet her body is also incorrupt. So the Virgin Mary, she is powerful against the devil, and the devil thinks his one world order is about to be finished. He's got the church almost in his pocket, with the Pope who's promoting horrible ideas and, and even heretical ideas. Uh, and he just recently, last week, prayed with the Lutherans, and uh, which and it's just a horrible scandal to the whole world. And visited a Lutheran temple in Rome. This is a terrible, terrible sacrilege and and bad example and scandal. So. The enemies of Christ think they have destroyed the church. They think they're about to bring about the one world order. But the Virgin Mary, she's going to step in like she did in Mexico and overthrow their plans. But it'll be in the last minute. It'll be when there's just one thread hanging on. And so it feels like we're at that time right now. But we don't know. God only knows. But we must keep the faith. And we cannot compromise the faith. And we cannot fall for accepting which happened just last week. The Society of St. Pius X superiors have now become officially an indult community. The SSPX, as we knew it, is now an indult community, just like St. Peter's, just like Institute of Christ the King, just like Campos Brazil. In five years, uh, La Baru had the new Mass. And in, in, within ten years, Campos Brazil had the new Mass, giving communion in the hand with altar girls. And the SSPX, the new SSPX, is heading in that direction. And they've already compromised. The most serious, terrible thing that could happen was 2012. The signing of the Doctrinal Declaration. Uh, by Bishop Fillet, because it accepts Vatican II, the new Mass, the new profession of faith, new code, very, very serious betrayals of the faith. And that's why you all know Father Daniel Thiemann. Pray for him. I, I, I worked with him on one camp, and I had him as a boy on camps in the years, years ago. But uh, how is it that he, who praised so highly the doctrinal declaration and defended it at St. Mary's, Kansas, with a standing ovation almost. How come he's being promoted as superior of the seminary in Australia? When he has publicly defended a compromised, horrible, modernist document that shows you the leaders are not interested in the stand of Archbishop Lefebvre anymore. It's over. They have abandoned Archbishop Lefebvre's position. And that's why the resistance priests who want to stay faithful to throughout the world, who want to stay faithful to that line of Archbishop Lefebvre, we have to oppose this new direction. And we have to defend the faith. And that means you little kids, you little uh, girls and boys, you have to stay close to the Virgin Mary and uh, keep the faith and spread the faith and keep the Holy Rosary and the brown scapular. Stay close to the Virgin Mary. And you good parents, continue, continue your great role to take the children God sends, raise them for heaven and, and uh, do what you can to be missionaries as well. Because we can't just, we can't just keep the the, the fire and the light of the faith in our home. We must spread that faith. We must spread that light. And it does convert souls when they see the goodness of a large family which is dying off. The large Catholic family is, is going into extinction. And divorce is like a cancer that has ravaged the whole Western world. Now more than half the marriages end up in divorce. So your family... The, fa the large Catholic family is an apostolate in itself. 
And you'll see as the children get over, everyone wants to go over to the house of the big families because it's there's so much going on and it's the most normal structure that God built. So be missionaries and uh, resist this terrible, horrible new direction. And the SSPX, pray for these good priests. There are many of them that you know, Father Themen and, and many good priests who should not be compromising the Catholic faith. They should go back and study Pashendi that condemn the very modern errors of Vatican II and compromise. And also reread the great story of Eleazar in Maccabees who would not compromise and eat, eat chicken or non-pork to appear like he, 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 he avoided, he, he preferred to die than appear to go along with the pagan mentality. And that's what Archbishop Lefebvre said. He said, we cannot play with the faith. So let's ask the Virgin Mary of Guadalupe to inflame our hearts with a great love for her and her divine son. And like St. Juan Diego, to really sanctify our whole soul and our whole life to obtain the happiness of heaven, to see the Virgin Mary with her divine son and the blessed Trinity in heaven for which we're made on, uh, here on earth. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost.